you, you Lord. Lord. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he put this question to his disciples. Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say he is John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But you, he said, who do you say I am? Then Simon Peter spoke up. You are the Christ, he said, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Simon, son of Jonah, you are a happy man, because it was not flesh and blood that revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Now I, so I say to you, so I now say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the underworld can never hold out against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be considered bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be considered loosed in heaven. Then he gave the disciples strict orders not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to make it clear to his disciples that he was destined to go to Jerusalem and suffer grievously at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, to be put to death and to be raised up on the third day. Then, taking him aside, Peter started to remonstrate with him. Heaven preserve you, Lord, he said. This must not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an obstacle in my path, because the way you think is not God's way, but man's. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks, Father. Today's homily is the turning point. I should say today's gospel is the turning point of the gospel of Matthew. And in this homily, I wanted to speak about that point particularly. Now, Jesus asks who they say that he is. And then he asks Peter and the others very personally, but who do you say I am? And Peter gets it right. And Jesus congratulates him on it. So much so that after this point in the gospel, after this revelation from Peter that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus then dedicates his time from that moment on to his disciples, on his way inexorably towards Jerusalem and to Calvary. Okay, And what he is trying to do is to change this image that the disciples have in their minds of who they think the Christ, the Saviour, will be. Because the image is false. It's fake news, not good news. And even today, this is a major issue with many Catholics and Christians. We have in our minds the image of a powerful and triumphant Christ when he has to go the path of the cross. There is no resurrection without Calvary. There is no Easter Sunday without Good Friday. Only this apparent failure is no failure at all. Jesus has a plan of battle which utterly took them by surprise and fooled them all, even his closest of disciples. Because his death on a cross was a sheer master class of revelation. In it, he reveals the power and the wisdom of God, for he would destroy death's power forever by undergoing it, he being the Son of God. He would show the power and the wisdom of God in the vulnerability and apparent senselessness of his death on the cross. Now, that's the first thing to note about this particular gospel, really important gospel, part of the gospel of Matthew. The second is this. Somehow, Simon Peter cottoned onto it. Somehow he knew that Jesus is the Christ. Now, Jesus says to him that the source of it was nothing human. He had discovered it for himself 
His Father had revealed it to him in his own personal prayer. It wasn't something that Jesus had said to him or to the others in some sort of private conversation that he had with them. Oh, no. And Jesus said, You are a happy man, Peter, because effectively it is the Father in heaven who has revealed that to you. But you're not just a happy man because you understood this but because you are someone that Jesus can rely on. You are going to be the rock on which he will build his church, foundation stone for the future, and the keys to the kingdom will be given to you. Because Jesus had seen that if Peter has this powerful communication direct to the Father, he now knows that he can go to the cross because at least one of those disciples has discovered the key. And he knew that Peter would be safe even though things would be difficult because he'd prayed for him and he saw that Peter was a man of prayer. Now, well, sort of safe. <laughs> In almost the next breath, he's going to tell him, get behind me, Satan. But we'll get to that another moment. But listen to the words he says to Simon. Simon, son of Jonah, you are a happy man. Now, I think it's time for us to ask our question, that question to ourselves. Are we happy men and women? Are we really happy? Maybe we've lost sight on what Jesus says in this crucial part of the gospel. Simon, you are a happy man because it was not flesh and blood that revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. So it wasn't in a homily. It wasn't a theologian or a saint. Someone who happened to share this with you in a group of prayer or something like that. No, no. It wasn't because you happened to have read someone's commentary on the scriptures before you came to that Mass. No, no. It was a private thing. It was a personal connection made in the silence of Peter's prayer. Through the Holy Spirit, the spirit of divine connectivity. We live in an age in which everyone wants to be connected. But sadly, they want to be connected to the internet connected with their phones, but they don't want to be connected with God. Or they don't set aside the time to be connected to the Holy Spirit of connectivity, divine connectivity. It's when you realize something personal for yourself, it is absolutely amazing. And it cements in you this knowledge that Jesus and you, there's a connection. One of the times that it happened to me was when I was in Colombia in Medellin, and I've spoken to it sometimes. It was from that scripture, Isaiah 49, 14 to 16. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast? Or a woman, the child of her womb? Those of you who are mothers know that that's just not possible. Yet even if these should forget, and remember, just beforehand, Zion was saying that God had abandoned them. He says, I will never forget you. I have carved you on the palm of my hand. Now that day in Medellin, Colombia, it was a day in which I realized that the risk was the same everywhere. The risk against my life was as great in the city of Medellin, Colombia, in times of Pablo Escobar, as it was in Spain, where I'd been for a few years, or back home in Australia, where I'd lived all my life. He had written my life on the palm of his hands. I experienced that for myself, and I realized nothing could happen to me outside of his loving plan. Jesus cross included. And it would all turn out all right, no matter what happened to me or anyone else for that matter. If God the Father could make such a huge eternal success out of a human tragedy like Calvary, then I realized that even my perhaps untimely death in the city of Medellin back in 1989 would not put a spanner in the works of the big things he'd promised that he would do in my life. Now, that was another moment for me as well when a priest said to me, it came through the mouths of a Catholic priest, he said, God has big things in store for you. But they hit me in such a way that I knew implicitly that those words had a source, but they were not just from that priest. I asked him a few months later, not too far from here actually, many, many moons ago, but I asked him, why did you say that to me? And he had no answer to give me because... He had no idea of the effect that those words had had on me. He had pronounced them, but it was God who had hit me like a sledgehammer. And I knew that it was God speaking. Now, years later in Ireland, I met his nephew. Now, he's also here in Sydney. He's a priest. 
Whoops. Sorry, it always happens. The connectivity. I just pressed the wrong button. <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> anyway, he's a priest, all right? And he told me that his uncle had said the same words to him, that God had big things in store for him, but he didn't seem to place any more on it, anything more on it, but not me. You see, I knew that God had spoken those words to me that day. How did I know this? Well, it's hard to say, but I just knew in my heart, like the time I felt he spoke to me on that train at Villawood Station, but what I do know is the joy of experiencing it is unforgettable. And that's what I want for every one of you. Not just to come to a Mass to listen to a homily, but that you yourselves discover in the Scriptures beforehand how God speaks to you in a way that was not said to you in the homily. That there is a personal communication with those words. That's why we have our schools of prayer on Tuesdays and Thursday nights, because we want for you to discover that for yourself. But the joy of experiencing how God's word leaps out of the page at you and into your heart is something that will stun you. It will captivate you. There is nothing like it. My vocation, 35 years of missionary life, hinges upon it. It's like what was said of Mary, that she pondered over those things that she hears in her heart, what they meant. Like Mary's experience with the angel Gabriel, she wondered what that greeting might mean. In the same way, you are meant to wonder what those words that impacted you in the gospel of today or in the first reading mean for you. Now, Peter had understood that Jesus is the Christ. Again, something no one else had said to him. He had perhaps imitated Jesus at prayer. He'd cottoned onto something, but he discovered it for himself. We need to experience it for ourselves as well. <laughs> Later on, well, Peter probably made the same mistake that Moses had made in that first reading. Later on, perhaps. I mean, it seems that, that the people of Israel, they refused to listen to God speak. They were rebellious. They refused to take possession of that promised land. They complained when they found themselves in the desert without the experience of God. And it seems that Moses must have forgotten, somehow failed as well because he wouldn't be entering the promised land. He would die on Mount Nebo, looking across from, to the western side of the Jordan. Now, Peter seems to have made a similar error at the end of our gospel of today. Maybe it is parallel to the error Moses made. Who knows? But it seems as if, having been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, he loses connection to the voice of God and he concentrates on himself. Fooled by Satan into thinking that maybe everything he says to Jesus would be God speaking. And that's what's said of Moses as well. Maybe he might have arrogantly told the people that he and Aaron would give them water in the desert. Who knows? It was also that same Moses, Jesus said, who gave us manna in the desert, but it was actually manna from heaven, what they were looking for. So it seems that perhaps our own self-sufficiency, when we think we know what God wants of us without talking to him, is something similar. But happy are you. When you listen to the scriptures, when you chew over them, and you have a conversation with God, may that happen today, and may you experience for yourselves God talking.